More than two years ago, I started a project that, well, I never finished. I attempted to 3D print a handheld retro gaming console. The video was filled with my frustration. and not being able to actually get my then new 3D printer to work properly. Furthermore, I was never able to get my hands on all of the electronics needed to actually build the Raspberry Pi based emulator because they were in such high demand. So I threw up my hands, gave up on the project and just let it rest. But the video did really well. And as a result, even two and a half years later, not a week goes by that I don't get at least someone asking me to revisit the project. So here we are. I'm going to 3D print a handheld retro gaming console. Again, given the relatively low cost of these handheld emulators, there are a ton of different designs online. Some are huge. Some are really pretty small. Some are insanely difficult to make, and some are pretty easy. The last video I made on emulation did really well, primarily because that build didn't require any soldering, but it wasn't handheld either. It did mean that a noob could do it in just a few minutes, and I like that, making a video that appeals to a lot of people, but we need to go deeper. So I chose one of the simplest 3D printed Raspberry Pi Zero projects. Now it's not the most powerful, and it's not the smallest, though it is pretty dang small, and it's not the cheapest, but I think that it offers the best price to performance to difficulty ratio. The project is called Game Boy Null by Ampersand. All of the parts together cost me $67, which is only about $20 more than if you used old school breadboards and spent all day soldering. So it's a pretty good value. The advantage to this build is that one, it requires very minimal and very easy soldering. Even a beginner could do it. Number two, the kit comes with pretty much mostly everything you need. Three, there's excellent documentation to walk you through the entire build process. And number four, I just really dig the small form factor and looks. Now this build is not without its faults. Number one, it's a little bit pricier than building your own design from scratch. Number two, and this one's a pretty big downside, there's no onboard audio. It's kind of a bummer. But you can add this yourself if you want to later on. It's just not part of the build. And number three, it runs on the Raspberry Pi Zero rather than the more powerful and also larger Raspberry Pi 3. It's done to cut down in cost and size. Now, this little guy will emulate NES, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, and Sega Master System games without a hitch. SNES titles will also run pretty well, but they're slightly slower than native. Everything after that, forget about it. In this episode, we're going to 3D print all of the necessary parts. If you've already got a 3D printer, you can find the files for this project free on Thingiverse.com. If you don't, you can use a service like Shapeways to order the 3D printed parts pretty inexpensively from a local maker or have them shipped to your home. I have a Prusa i3 Mark III 3D printer and I love it. Now look, I know that a lot of you may not be familiar with how 3D printers work, but believe it or not, they're actually a lot less complicated than you might think. The simplicity of these printers have really helped drive down the price in recent years, and you can get a decent Chinese-made printer for just a couple hundred dollars nowadays. It all begins with the filament. This is essentially a really long strand of plastic wrapped around a spool. Now, filament comes in different colors and plastic types. Some plastics are flexible, some are rigid, some have high melting temperatures, and some have low melting temperatures. Most people print in PLA, polylactic acid, because it's the easiest to print, but I actually prefer PETG, polyethylene terephthalate glycol. Say that five times fast. <laughs> it's slightly more flexible and has a much higher melting temperature than PLA, but really both plastics were great. They're non-toxic, pretty inexpensive at about $20 for a one kilogram spool, which lasts for a long time. Anyways, the filament feeds down into this thing. It's called the extruder carriage. A little stepper motor rotates this little gear with grippy teeth, and that pushes the plastic into what's called the hot end. And you guessed it, the hot end is really hot. <laughs> it takes the solid filament and melts it into a malleable plastic. And then the melted plastic gets pushed through a tiny nozzle that's usually just 0.4 millimeters wide. And the printer squirts out the plastic into a flat shape and then slowly builds on top of it layer by layer until you get your finished 3D print. It's really simple. 
But how does a 3D printer know how to print an object? Well, pretty much every 3D printer runs similar open source firmware that can read machine language called G-code. When you download or design a 3D object, you have to put the file into a desktop application called a slicer. Now there are a lot of slicers, some are paid, some are free. Most are actually free and open source. But when you import your 3D file, you can tell your printer how to print the object. For example, with what plastic, at what temperature, what layer height, which determines the speed and quality of the print, etc. Then, once you've set all your settings, you can export this G-code file, which is basically just a huge text file that you can actually open and read. And as you can see, G-code just basically tells the printer what X, Y, and Z coordinates to move the nozzle to, and how much plastic to spit out along the way. It's very simple, but it works really, really well. So let's start with the main case. I'm going to print the front and back shell in this semi-transparent PETG. It does become less clear when you start stacking several layers, sadly, but it might be kind of see-through when we're done, and I think that it will look pretty cool. We're going to do a 0.15 millimeter layer height, so the stacked layers aren't too visible, and hot dog, that looks good. Let's export the G-code and start the print. Enjoy the sexy time lapse. One of my favorite things about my Prusa printer is that it has a removable and flexible build plate, which allows me to easily remove parts without the use of a putty knife, which most printers really pretty much require. And wow, these prints look great. The layer lines look awesome, and the print is really sharp. PETG is a slightly stringy plastic, so I'm going to have to sand it down really quickly but it's gonna look awesome. It's not hyper transparent, but you will be able to see through it near sunlight, I think. It looks pretty cool. Okay, so now I need to print the power switch, the select and start buttons, the L and R shoulder buttons, and the D-pad. I'm gonna do all of them in this grayish silver because I think they'll be a nice contrast with the transparent. And then I actually want to print each of the A, B, X, Y buttons in the classic Nintendo Famicom colors. I didn't have blue filament, <laughs> so for the X button, I just printed it in purple. And it looks very wrong, but don't worry, I've already got more plastic on the way and we'll have it fixed for the video about the electronics. Oh, by the way, I'm not in love with the yellow transparent color either, and I'm gonna reprint that with a more solid color looking plastic so that it will match the rest of the buttons. All in all, I'm really happy with the way this thing turned out, and I think it is going to look awesome when everything is finally assembled. Things are going a lot better than the first time around. <laughs> I will admit though that I want to switch up the gray because I think it just looks a little bit silly with the transparent case. Do you have any thoughts on the matter? If so, leave a comment below with what color you think that the D-pad and other buttons should be. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed learning how 3D printers work and are excited for part two where I'll actually put everything together with a little solder on the side. If you're interested in following along with this project, links are down below so you can build your own. Other than that though, if you liked this video, please give it a like. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. But thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.